My name is James Trujari, and I'm the Executive Director at Legal Assistance for Seniors. It is my honor to welcome you to today's program, Holding Financial Institutions Accountable for Financial Elder Abuse, presented by Catherine Stebner and Neil McCarthy. This is the last in our series of webinars addressing various topics on elder abuse. As you all probably know, when we hold the conference in person, it takes many dedicated people and agencies coming together to produce such a large function. And this webinar series is no different. First, I would like to thank our sponsors who continue to support the conference in a webinar format. Their continued dedication and excitement for the work we do is critical for the success of this webinar series, and we offer our deepest gratitude. In particular, we'd like to thank our Diamond Level sponsor, Michael Stevens, Probate and Trust Realtor. Michael Stevens has always been an incredible support to LAS and is always there to help with great enthusiasm. If it involves supporting older adults, Michael is always there with a big yes and how can I help? In addition to a high level of professionalism, Michael and his team at Coracan Global Living Real Estate bring much empathy and compassion to the many probate and trust sales that they handle. Michael approaches each transaction, whether for his customers or for working with conservators, attorneys, or other fiduciaries with real understanding. Thanks to you and Coracan Global Living, Michael, for your steadfast support of LAS over the years. We have a whole host of sponsors, which we will announce in just a moment. We thank our sponsors for their steadfast commitment to this webinar series and to our mission of protecting older adults' rights and dignities in Alameda County. In addition, Golden Gate University has continued to support LAS in this webinar series with technical support and serving as an honorary event host. We greatly appreciate this partnership with GGU. Last but not least is the team that has contributed their time and hard work over the past several months to transition this in-person conference to an online experience. Greg Bedard, Jenny Pardini, Shauna Reeves, and the entire LAS staff, thank you. Now for some housekeeping before we get started with today's program. We have a wonderful presentation followed by a live Q&A. If you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Staff will be monitoring these questions for the moderator. We will try to get to all your questions, but if we're not unable to answer everything during the session, we will do our best to follow up with you after the presentation. For those who need continuing education units, you will receive a post-event email within a day or two of this session with steps on redeeming your credits. Lastly, we welcome your feedback to help us improve your experience and continue to offer high quality education through a post-event survey. As I'm sure you're aware, today's presentation is part of a series of four webinars LAS is producing in the coming weeks. They are all free of charge and open to the public, though a donation of $25 per webinar will be greatly appreciated and accepted in order to support our ongoing work. We hope you find these presentations informative and useful. You can register for these webinars by visiting our website, lashicap.org, that's L-A-S-H-I-C-A-P.org, and going to events. Thank you again for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the program. Good afternoon. My name is Jenny Pardini and I'm the Community Education Coordinator with Legal Assistance for Seniors. I'm delighted to be your moderator for this webinar. Today you will hear a one hour educational presentation from our guest speakers, followed by a Q&A that I will be moderating. If you have any questions for our speakers, please submit them at any point in the program by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the meeting screen. If you have any technical issues, you can ask us in the chat and our technical team will do their best to assist you. If you would like to use the closed caption feature, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of the meeting screen and choose show subtitle. Before we get started with today's speakers, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors for this webinar series. As Jim had mentioned previously, we have Michael Stevens with Kokoran Global Living as our diamond level sponsor. The Tile Shop with their showroom in neighboring Berkeley, and Acuna Regley with business in estate planning, probate and trust administration, and conservatorship and special needs trusts are our two gold level sponsors. At the silver level, we have the law firm of Anderson, Yazdi, Huang, Minton, and Horn LLP, Ingrid Evans with the Evans Law Firm, 
the Professional Fiduciary Association of California, and Senior Alternatives. At the bronze level, we have ARM Homes. Many thanks to Zert Institute and CAPAPGPC for providing continuing education units for attendees of this webinar. And sincerest gratitude to our community partners at the Alameda County Area Agency on Aging, the East Bay Foundation on Aging, the California Elder Justice Coalition, Legal Aid Association of California, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, and the Elder Abuse Prevention Program at the Institute on Aging. Thank you again to our wonderful sponsors. It is my pleasure to introduce you to today's speakers, Catherine Stebner and Neil McCarthy. Catherine Stebner founded uh, Stebner, Gertler, Guadani, Kawamoto, um, and has devoted over 30 years to fighting for the rights of others. From testifying in support of legislation on behalf of elderly and dependent adults, to being a formidable adversary in the courtroom on behalf of the victims of abuse or improper care. Her efforts make a difference in the lives of people living in California. Catherine is a prolific writer who has contributed to numerous publications, and she's also in demand as a speaker on topics related to law and procedures pertaining to elder care, assisted living, and litigation, appearing recently in the New York Times, Bloomberg, the Los Angeles Times, CNN, and NBC News. Catherine graduated from the University of Oregon with a BA in political science and received her JD from the University of San Francisco School of Law. Neil McCarthy, has practiced extensively in the area of elder abuse, including obtaining multi-million dollar recoveries on behalf of senior citizens in actions involving reverse mortgages, and has been retained by San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, Alameda County, and Santa Cruz County to prosecute financial elder abuse cases. In addition, he has handled many notable cases against nursing homes, including well-publicized actions for the families of three victims who died at a San Mateo County nursing home during a heat wave, and an action on behalf of a developmentally disabled person who was severely burned while left unattended in a nursing home shower. He obtained a punitive damage jury verdict after trying an elder abuse case against a nursing home and won a unanimous jury verdict in a hotly contested financial elder abuse trial involving the misuse of a senior citizen's life savings. He's a member of the American Board of Trial Advocates, International Academy of Trial Lawyers, International Society of Barristers, and American College of Trial Lawyers. Catherine and Neil, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's always a pleasure uh, to work with my friend Catherine. Um, so let, why don't we go ahead and jump, jump right in. What we're going to try to do today is focus uh, on this issue of financial elder abuse. And we're gonna talk about uh, the law in California. We're gonna talk about some practical areas where financial elder abuse occurs. And we're gonna talk about how you can address those problems in litigation. One of the themes you're gonna hear from us uh, throughout this presentation uh, is the breadth of the elder abuse law in California. It's a very elastic law that can be applied to protect senior citizens uh, in almost any type of financial scam. So what's the first thing we do uh, when we have a, a financial elder abuse case in California? Well, you know, we always suggest go back and look at the legislative findings in the California elder abuse law. So if we were to take a look at the first slide, we have a couple of these highlighted for you. And the California elder abuse law is very unusual because usually when you're a trial attorney and particularly when you're a plaintiff's attorney, you go to court uh, and there is this uh, perception that you are trying to get money for someone or you are doing something uh, that you shouldn't be doing because the effect uh, that the insurance companies have had uh, on the press and the image they put out there. Well, when you go on an elder abuse case, it's much, much different because you're there because the legislature wants you to be there. So if we look at the first slide, you'll see uh, that in the Welfare and Institutions Code, this is the 15600 section, what it states uh, is that there's a finding that senior citizens are a disadvantaged class and there needs to be incentives to prosecute elder abuse suits. The purpose of the law is to enable interested people to engage attorneys and take up the cause of senior citizens. 
And if you go through the rest of that um, section 15600, which I don't have there, but you read through it in, in subsection A, it says the state has a responsibility to protect senior citizens. And that special attention needs to be paid to senior citizens because they are the most vulnerable part of our population. So before you open your mouth in court, you have been given an invitation to be there by the California legislature, and you're there to protect senior citizens. So I use that language in my complaint, in the CMC filings, in the pretrial filings, and certainly when we get time uh, for the jury instructions, it's something you should be aware of and something you should point out to the court at all available opportunities. Uh, if we could turn to the next slide. I just wanna cover a couple basics here um, and the remedies available uh, in California law. Well, certainly you have compensatory damages. Uh, with a financial elder abuse case, you're entitled to reasonable attorney's fees and costs. And what's unique here is on the financial elder abuse side, it's a different standard than other areas of elder abuse in California. It's a simple preponderance standard. So compensatory damages, uh, preponderance standard, attorney's fees preponderance standard, and by the way, uh, reimbursement of cost of the conservator, because I know we have a number of probate attorneys here, those are also the preponderance standard. Punitive damages uh, is the clear and convincing standard. Uh, let's talk for a second about one other unique law in California, uh, uh, which is the trebling of damages. Uh, that is Civil Code 3345. This is for actions against senior citizens, and it applies to um, laws that are designed to be a penalty or punish. So as a typical civil practitioner, we argue that for any type of punitive damage finding against a senior citizen, uh, it should be trebled. I know we have a number of government attorneys here uh, with a 17200 case uh, and the penalties that the government can collect there. Uh, same argument applies. All right, uh, let's take a look at the next slide, please. Slide four. And this is what I had just mentioned. Uh, this is the actual language of the uh, Elder Abuse Act as it relates to uh, financial elder abuse. And you can see, again, there's a much different standard here. It's a preponderance for fees as opposed to the clear and convincing standard you need for physical abuse, uh, neglect, uh, abandonment, things like that. All right. Uh, I, I do want to talk about B for a moment. I'm going to ask Catherine to chime in, uh, only so we understand the dichotomy uh, of the burden of proof on a financial case. There is a clear and convincing standard. But that would only apply to the punitive damage claim, as well as the claim for pre-death pain and suffering that you can recover post-death, uh, which we know is typically barred in California. At least it was barred until a new law that was just enacted this year. Uh, but that standard uh, is clear and convincing. Uh, and Catherine, let me let you chime in there before I go too further. Yeah, I just think it's important uh, to remember, and maybe Neil, since uh, I... I was involved, but probably you more with CAOC involved in changing it. We might want to just tell people in California about that law, just to remind them about the pre-death pain and suffering. But yeah, it's a totally different standard. All you need is preponderance of evidence for attorney's fees and also um, uh, general damages before someone dies. The only time you need it uh, for the uh, dehythen remedy is for uh, having pre-death pain and suffering. That's it. So it is really, really different than the law in um, in elder abuse cases for physical abuse. All right. Uh, so let's talk just for a second about this treble damage uh, statute that I mentioned. Uh, again, this would apply to penalties or punitive damages. If we could slide, uh, go to the next slide, and we could actually just skip this one. Uh, let's go to the one after that. But what we're going to see here when we talk about financial elder abuse is a trend that the legislature made these laws as broad as possible to encompass any potential type of conduct. So these are the factors you look at uh, under the trebling statute. Item one, whether the defendant knew or should have known the conduct was directed as a senior. All right, uh, obvious enough, but let's look at item two. Whether defendant's conduct cause one or more seniors or disabled persons to suffer 
loss of encumbrance of a primary residence, principal employment, or source of income, substantial loss of property set aside for retirement, or for personal or family care and maintenance, or substantial loss of payments received under a pension or retirement or government plan, or assets essential to the health and welfare of the senior citizen or disabled person. Well, uh, if you are a lawyer with any type of creativity, there's really not a financial scam that doesn't fit within that definition. Uh, and as we talk about the elder abuse uh, definition under the Welfare and Institutions Code, really the same thing applies. So again, understand the concept that if you're going to do a financial elder abuse case, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in the definitions under California law that enable you to go after virtually anybody, whether it's a, a bank, uh, a financial advisor, another attorney. Uh, be aware that if there is a wrongdoer, uh, there is a way to find them accountable. Catherine, let me kick it back to you. Yeah, and I just want to add on the 3345, um, it's an underused um, statute in California. Well, the whole financial elder abuse case, the cases are um, underused. And in fact, um, Kirsten Fish and I, uh, every year we write the chapter and uh, look for new cases on uh, suing institutions for financial abuse in the CEB book. And there's just not that much case law at all which is one of the reasons I agreed to do it because there's not a lot of case law, you know, and everyone knows I'm lazy. So anyway, but it's an area where you just don't need, there's just not that much case law on it, which I as a plaintiff's lawyer like. Um, it's been a new area and I've been talking about this for a really long time. 3345 is a really underused statute. The thing about it is you need what's called a hook basically for it. So you need to have an underlying cause of action that has a, a more of a penalty in it, you know? And basically, if you if you look at the language, it looks like a lot like 17200. And I, th I think there's some people here from other states on that, but um, any for sort of consumer, um, consumer acts or something like that, it basically, and hopefully it looks to see if you have a 30, 3345, but basically they look very similar, 17200 and 3345 look really similar on their face. So you need some sort of statute to kind of hook it in, but it's got to be something that has a has a basically a penalty in it in some way. And so, and we argue also that the elder abuse statute itself is has a penalty in it um, because of the um, attorney's fees. So we make that argument. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, there's some really important words in this. So this is, uh, I hope people can see this, this I'm 62, but I've got good eyesight, but I, I can read it. Um, so anyway, this is the uh, statutory definition of elder abuse in California and other states have similar ones. I'm also licensed up in Oregon. As you heard, I went to University of Oregon and uh, it's a little bit different up there. Um, but anyway, so here's some important words in here. Um, takes, secretes i don't really know what secretes means does anyone do you know neil, neil do you know what that word really means secretes uh, i always took that to mean takes and hides it from someone okay it's, it's like, a, like a secret yeah okay <laughs> yeah. So it, uh, appropriates stick, obtains stick takes. Yeah, sticks with takes yeah exactly well stick with takes um, <laughs> obtains a uh, real real property of an elder for a wrongful use of the intent to defraud or both. Okay, there's a lot of words in there, but there's certain words in there that are really, really important in what I'll call the action words. So um, takes. So when I first started doing things, um, Neil was still, I think in grade school or something at the time when I started or junior high at least, uh, you know, but he was really in college at the time, but he, you know, during this period of time when this first started coming out, it's like, well, what does this mean? I like take, you know, do you have to like take something? Well, there's a case, one of the really early cases is the Negrete case, N-E-G-R-E-T-E. -E. And that was a case regarding annuities. And so we didn't really, there's not a lot printed on here about annuities, but I just want to mention them because that's how I really started in these cases was in annuity cases um, in taking up the property of someone. And, you know, they would give, for example, you know, a hundred year old, you know, a, a annuity that was, you know, didn't come to fruition until they were 120. And the law in um, annuities is that the worse profit it is, 
the more commission there is for the sleazy person suing it. So there's been a lot of um, laws, thanks to really uh, mostly Prescott Cole, who used to be at Canner, on really kind of helping with these cases and whether they're suitable suitable or not. But really, this is really much easier than it used to be, the, what taking means. So anytime someone, you know, just rips you off, that's taking now. And that's really, really clear. It wasn't at the beginning, but that's super clear. And then the other term that's really important in here is wrongful use. And this is where a lot of the action is. And so it's really important um, because it's defined in uh, Welfare and Institutions Code 156103B. And that means when an entity knew or should have known the conduct was likely to be harmful of the elder or dependent adult. And this new or should have known obviously is really important as opposed to new. Um, you know, that's where all the action is, a lot of it in these cases. And you need to know that new or should have known is based on a reasonable person standard or negligence standard. And this is really important. Um, and I think a lot of people don't really appreciate this, but what it means is when we look at these cases, we're fo focusing on the knowledge of the people who are assisting or taking. It's not the knowledge of the elder. Um, so just because an elder believes that is the scam is true, which is almost all of our cases, and I'll go into those later. Um, and even if they went along with it, with as a reasonable person would have not have the case is really looking at the what the um, person who's the perpetrator is looking at. So that's really important because so when a case comes to you, you're like. In every case that comes to us, like, oh my God, how could this person have believed this? How could they believed it? You know, and we'll get into that. But really, the focus is not on them. It's really easy, as, and they want you to focus on them. They want you to say, "Hey, your person's not demented. I mean, your person's competent. They're like dealing with the bank. Irrelevant. Might be relevant to a jury, because but the law is that it's not relevant." So the sole focus is on the actual constructive knowledge of the person who is the one who's doing the ripping off. Okay, super important. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Um, I think there was, okay, yeah. Oh, let's, can we go back to the other slide for a minute? There's something I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, so we talked about the takes, secretes, appropriates, and where the focus is. We talked about the Negri case. We talked about wrongful uh, uh, use. Here is where all of the big action is right now. Number two, assists in taking or secreting. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, and so right now in California, um, well, there was a case uh, in 2010 called DAS, D-A-S, which is the um, next to Micra, which has been the bane of my existence my entire career until recently. DAS has been the second bane of my, my existence. And so early on, this DAS case um, talked about whether it's a new or should have known. And what happened was, um, is politically, um, Daryl Steinberg, uh, who he became um, the speaker, and he, uh, there's someone who named Steve Reese, who did a lot of these cases before, and he wrote the, what I'll call the new law. He put in assists, he put in all these things, knew or should have known. And the law, and Neil will appreciate this, having been past president of CAC and really involved in Sacramento, the law went through as written. Changes weren't made. It was like perfect because no one wanted to, I pro I'm, I'm guessing, upset this new guy in a lot of power. So anyway, this law is amazing. Um, and they put this assist in here. And the reason that they put assist in here, and I think this is relevant to our cases, is because Steve had a case um, and it was against Washington Mutual as a bank. And so in that case, there was a woman, an elderly woman who had a lot of money in her account. This is classic, okay? comes up to the teller and the teller sees, oh, she's got about, you know, several hundred thousand or something sitting in a bank, not earning any interest or anything. So she said, hey, you should go over and talk to, you know, the gentleman in the corner over here in the, in the bank. So she goes over there and the financial advisor for watching Mutual, and we're going to talk about the differences 
how different and separate the financial advisors are to the actual bank, went and did something. And so that's where assist came from because the bank teller assisted in that happening, even though they were in the same bank, they were two separate parties, the advisors and the bank. But that's the reason for this law and that is the intent of this law. And so when, when he changed that law and that law got changed, DOS was looking at the old law before knew or should have known, before assist, all those sorts of things, what wrongful use was. And so DOS said, hey, we're saying that you have to you have to know it's not should have known so it's basically you know didn't say aid and abet but you know that's what the, that's what the banks are saying now you, you you need to know you need to know so in other words you need to know the elder comes up to the window and says hey i'm being ripped off basically i mean it's got to be like clear as a bell okay and so what what they're saying is this DOS still applies, even though DOS said, no, we're looking at the old law. And so we were saying, no, there's a new law. There's a new sheriff in town. That's what I always say. There's a new sheriff in town. So, but for some reason, there's been some federal uh, judges who are, you know, uh, Trump appointees who are sort of blowing off DOS basically and trying to do pre-DOS with the new law. Um, and so, we have had, uh, our firm has had good success in state uh, cases against, uh, we just had one against B of A where on the same exact issue and uh, the court in, in uh, San Francisco, we've had two judges in San Francisco say there's a new sheriff in town as well, the DOS doesn't apply. So um, this is where um, I would say in, in suing banks, especially, this is where 95% of the action is right now, this exact issue. So um, if you, because we wanna keep the law uh, as we want it, which we think it is, um, if people um, have this, um, please contact myself or Kirsten Fish um, and uh, at, at Needham, Kepner and Fish in San Jose, contact one of us, and we'll we'll be happy to give you our briefs. We'll be happy to give you the judge's opinions because you know we want to we want to keep this law in the state of California as it should be. So you know we don't want to make bad law here. So we really um, want to put this out, and maybe we can even give it to um, to the sponsor of this or something like that. We want to make sure everyone has that. Okay. So the next slide is on the burden of proof. Um, hey, Kathy, before you leave, the yeah. takeaway on the, these bank cases, at least yeah. the wire the wire fraud cases, to file in state court. Uh, because what we've seen uh, is yeah. the trend right now is the state courts are applying the new or, or should have known. The federal courts are applying the old aiding and abetting standard, which is actual knowledge. And if you have to right. prove actual knowledge by a bank, forget about it. You'll never win. So if you have one of these cases, and these cases defined as senior citizen goes into bank, you know, all the money is wired to, you know, Peru, wherever it goes. You really want to be in state court. Given Thailand. The jurisprudence, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that is the takeaway. Thank you, Neil. Um, you, you, you should file in state court. Um, and I don't think, uh, you know, the defendants will say that if you add um, the head of the bank or not the head of the bank, but if you like, if they're, you know, based in Delaware, for example, the bank is, um, and you name the manager of the bank, they're going to say it's a sham pleading, you know, to keep it in state court. It's not a sham pleading because you need, you know, if you want to prove, especially pre-death pain and suffering, you're gonna, you know, you want to have to prove recklessness. You know, you want to get into the knowledge of that person, and they may work for different companies, whatever. Just like in nursing home cases, you never know exactly who someone works for, honestly. And so, um, if you, I think it's completely ethical, and I think as I do in my uh, in my cases against nursing homes, I name our firm names the administrator or the regional manager for the same reason. So. Um, yes, please, if you can stay out of federal court right now, um, the, the cases are definitely much better in state court on that. So thanks, Neil. Okay, so um, next one is on the burden of proof. I think we've kind of covered this through Neil, but if we could bring up the next slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so again, just know that in a uh, Financial elder abuse cases, you have a much lower standard of proof than you do in the uh, cases for elder abuse for physical abuse, which we have been trying, actually, and we're going to try again, 
to change that law to have the physical be the same as the financial. So, you know, it's not fair that we'd have to prove more for a physical than a financial. The financial we think is the correct standard to do it. Um, and I will also say that um, at the beginning, I agree with Neil uh, about the statute and its intent. So uh, again, I hate to talk about my age so much, but I'm just like really feeling it lately. So uh, I, it was in 1991, uh, the law uh, was changed for physical abuse to add, and, and this is where a lot of this history comes from, Neil, is that there was always an elder abuse act but what happened in 91 was they gave enhanced remedies. And the reason that they gave enhanced remedies is just exactly why Neil said, because like myself and like two other people were basically doing these cases and they're like, hey, we need other people, incentivize other people to do it. And at the time, even on the physical cases, there are only two lawyers defending those cases in California, two different women who were sole practitioners. That's how much this has grown since the legislature changed that statute. But I think the legislature, in terms of the physical and the financial abuse, there's so much out there that says that, you know, we're on our side. And I agree with Neil that it's the only case. There's not a lot of fee cases, Neil. I mean, I don't know if you know a lot of other ones, but there's a, not a lot of one-way fee uh, areas in the state of California. I think there's maybe one or two. And so we're walking to the courtroom um, on these cases with a leg up on these cases, absolutely. You know, it's one of the few where normally like Neil, Neil says, you know, we're walking, you know, coming in, you know, the greedy plaintiff's lawyer, the greedy person coming in. This one, the law is actually in our favor. And the history tells us this on both of the cases, both on Daryl Steinberg's bill and on the 1991 changes. So the whole scheme, I agree, is really um, important to set that up. Um, so I think just jury instructions are next. And I'm just going to go through these super quickly because we really went through these, um, but just so you have them. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the basic is um, 3100. It's the 3100 series, but um, the essential elements are in 3100. Um, and actually, I think I have, a, and then 3101, we talked about that you'd have to, for the pre-death pain and suffering, you need more. Um, and then we've got the 3102 a um, for both the individual and employer. We see that in both the physical and financial, that there's different instructions if you want to go after an employee and the um, individual. I'm sure, Neil, also, we usually get stipulations um, from that we don't have to do this and say that the person is in the course and scope. So normally we don't have to use this. We usually get that. And then we have the 3117 undue influence explained. I think, uh, Neil, you're going to go into that. So let's do the next slide. Huh. I don't have this one. <laughs> it's not on my thing. It looks different on mine. OK. Uh, it's actually prettier on here than on mine. So, um, so this is the uh, essential elements that we talked about before. Uh, and oh, here's one thing that's kind of interesting um, to point out, which we forget about actually in the physical too. This is el this is a uh, elder and dependent uh, adult act. So you can have a dependent adult on this too. Let's not forget that. And the definition of a dependent adult is listed in um, in the statutes and. Oddly enough, it's not for minors. Um, so if you have a person under 18, um, you don't count. But if you are a person who is a dependent adult, and by definition, that is someone who's in different institutions, like a hospital, for example, you're a dependent adult. Um, and uh, so, you know, lots of people um, who have different um, challenges in their life or something that are growing up and then they may have, you know, people ripping them off as well. So don't forget the dependent adult um, in the cases. And I think we all do. Um, and then we have, we, you know, it talks about the assisting, obtaining. We talked about that. So next, next one, please. Um, you know, that they're a dependent adult or 65. It's not 62, 65. Uh, we talked about the assisting, retain. We talked about that, that they were harmed. Okay, let's talk about harm. Um, it's very broad. 
is harm. Um, and in, you know, what we try to do to even talk about the taking sometimes is we talk about, um, as some of you know, cases, big class actions against banks that are not elder cases. Banks make all their money by fees. I don't know if you guys know that, but that's how they make money by fees. I mean, all those little fees that you pay is how they make their money. Um, so don't forget about any fees that they paid. So you may need that as a hook for something uh, in some of these laws. So don't forget that they had to pay some fees or interest or whatever in setting something up. Um, and then it's a substantial factor. Um, so Kathy, Last, let me just jump yeah. on the substantial factor. Let me just jump in if I could for one second. And, and because this yeah. comes up in all the uh, financial elder abuse cases. Mm -hmm. Typically, you have one uh, wrongdoer, they perpetrate the fraud, but they're assisted by others, whether it's banks, you know, real estate professionals, uh, financial advisors, whoever it is. And you always hear the refrain that, well, wait a minute, it wasn't us, it was the wrongdoer. It was the actual person who directly caused um, the financial elder abuse. And we're just, you know, kind of secondary players, innocent victims. And I think it's important to understand in California what substantial factor means. So, first of all, you could have more than one substantial factor. So you could have the primary perpetrator, you could have the bank, you could have multiple substantial factors that write in the jury instruction. And if you look at the jury instruction in California, uh, which is 430, what it says is a substantial factor is something that's more than remote or trivial. So the bar again is low for a substantial factor in California. And so you get the argument from the secondary player that, hey, it wasn't us. Um, you know, it was the primary person. We just got dragged in by the lawyers. Understand what your burden is in proving substantial factor in California. Sorry, Catherine. Yeah, no, no, that's an uh, that's a really excellent point because obviously, uh, especially in the cases against banks, um, I would say maybe ten percent of those cases she'll actually ever find the perp, the actual beginning perp. Um, one, you know, and that's because they're in jail. <laughs> otherwise they're fake names they're whatever and you'll never ever find them uh and you actually will never know their names um so i think that's actually um i'm gonna say maybe the most important point that's been made today is what neil just said um and so you know i really thank you for saying that because that is um gonna, gonna be an issue so thank you um so next slide is just uh so it, we just talk about, it's just again, repeating uh, 3,100. Um, and again, we have new or should have known in here. We believe that that is the law, even in assist, um, the deprivation. And, uh, and then also at the end, there's a bunch of stuff we haven't actually used, but some people doing more probate type things about deprived of property by an agreement, gift, will, trust, or other testamentary instrument, regardless if it was held um, by the plaintiff or his or her representative. So, you know, sometimes this is above my pay grade um, in these cases. And I really, Dina Zacharin, who's at my firm, used to do, um, actually still does estate planning. And so we get her buddies at other law firms to really help us with some of these things get really complicated as to even who the plaintiff is. And we need to name, I don't know, Neil, if you've had that issue, but like, is it the trust, the trustee? Is it, the, are you the representative of something? So, you know, that's something actually that sometimes takes a long time for us as non, you know, estate planning lawyers to really figure out the right, right person. So, um, you know, I usually punt that to someone smarter than I am in that area, but that, that, that can be challenging to figure out. All right, Neil. Okay. So what we want to do is just talk about a couple other uh, areas of law, punitive damages, uh, and the concept of undue influence. And then we're going to talk about um, some situations where financial elder abuse uh, takes place currently, and we're going to talk a little bit about discovery uh, and some things you should be doing uh, if you're going to handle these cases. So let's first talk about punitive damages. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, there's a lot of confusion on how punitive damages relate to uh, elder abuse because there's a cross-reference to the punitive damage statute in the elder abuse law. But the bottom line is that the same rules apply in an elder abuse case as they would in any type of punitive damage case. So what do we mean by that? You need to show more than just you had a bad employee stealing from people. Okay, you have to show the company uh, should be responsible. 
And the statutes on the company being responsible, let's just walk through them um, quickly. And what we're looking at here is Casey 3102A, uh, so employer liabilities. Uh, and to hook in the employer, there's really two ways to do it, I mean, as a practical matter. Okay, well, one is that the first way to do is that the, the wrongdoer was a managing agent. And you rarely get that lucky, okay? Rarely is it somebody at the top of the food chain uh, who's doing the active stealing from the senior. Uh, but if you do, um, you know, God bless you, then you're off on punitive damages. More practically, if you look on uh, at items two and items four, this is how you prove punitive damages against a financial institution. So item two, you have to show that the company had advanced knowledge of the unfitness of the employee. So how do you do that? You do that by establishing prior notice, uh, prior notice of the employee engaging in similar conduct or prior activities by the employee where they had not taken appropriate conduct. What do I mean by that? Let's take the classic wire transfer case. The employee has had two or three other occasions where they allowed suspicious wires and now they're doing it in your case. That can be argued to be prior notice of the unfitness of the employee such that punitive damages would be in play. The second common way you prove punitive damages is in item four here uh, and what the um, elements re re refer to as adopting or approving the conduct after it occurs. That's the cover-up, okay? That's the classic scenario where you have an employee who goes rogue, violates the company policies, and instead of coming clean, what they do is cover it up. And the cover-up allows you to argue that the company, the financial institution, adopted the conduct of the employee such that they should be liable for punitive damages. So other thing to remember with punitive damages is that the defendant has the right to do an election to bifurcate the punitive damage phase, which means you must serve your financial worth discovery, financial net worth of defendants, and force them to bifurcate that. They either got to give you the financial net worth information or they got to bifurcate and have the punitive damages in the second phase only after you know the finding of malice, oppression, uh, or fraud. All right, let's go... Yes. Can, I, can I talk about um, uh, three and four for a minute? Can I ask something here? Okay. So um, I like three and four. And, I, and, you know, these are the same ones, obviously, that we have that we need to prove in our financial elder abuse cases for, you know, if we want to get uh, pre-death pain and suffering or just our regular, you know, uh, physical neglect cases. I like three because I think in these cases, having taken a lot of depositions of people that are really high up, you know, especially the PMQs, which we're going to go on, they don't know anything except that they have a risk out there. And I, I do believe that those uh, managing agents, um, and I have taken people, the head of, you know, of the fraud department or something like that, the little that they know and then the little that they train, I do think there's direct liability on their part. And I, I, I like that in these cases. Number four to me is what I always call the low hanging fruit in all these cases. And that's just simply, okay, I, you know about this case, you know, we've been talking about it, you know how this happened, you know where the cracks are. What have you done, if anything, to make those changes? Nothing. When they say that, I think I've hit number four. I think they're ratifying a behavior, even if they know, I mean, because they know that some bad things happen, they know that things you know, in there to slip through the cracks. They, they're saying it's not our fault, but they do nothing to make the changes so it won't happen again um, because they're so stubborn in admitting, and this is the same in, you know, any elder abuse case, they're so stubborn to admit that. And, I, you know, the few times when someone's actually made a change, I'm like, great as an advocate. I'm like, boo, as a lawyer, <laughs> you know, because they just do not do it. So I, I think that three and four in financial elder abuse cases are even stronger than in um, in physical ones. So those are those are my two go tos. Be good. All right. So let's talk about undue influence for a moment. Then we're going to uh, move into some um, practical applications. So we could go to the next slide. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, again, this is the jury instruction, great way to understand uh, what the law is. Uh, there's four factors, uh, always subparts. And the first thing to recognize is uh, in the 
definition at the beginning, it says undue influence means excessive persuasion that overcomes another person's free will and causes the person to do something or not do something that causes an unfair result. Again, incredibly broad, you know, conduct that causes an unfair result. And if you continue reading, the jury must, it says must, consider all of the following. And there's four categories. And if you look at the categories, again, incredibly broad. Uh, category one, plaintiff's vulnerability. Factors to consider uh, include, but are not limited to, incapacity, illness, disability, injury, age, education, impaired mental abilities, emotional distress, isolation. And then if you can't fit something uh, under any of those, uh, you have, and whether the defendant knew or should have known of the plaintiff's vulnerability. In other words, you have all these, um, all this way to prove the vulnerability of the plaintiff, and then you can fall back on, and here's what the defendant knew. And the defendant knew they were, you know, 80. The defendant knew they lived alone. The defendant knew that the spouse had died recently. The defendant knew that the rest of the family was on the East Coast. A number of ways to prove that. Um, B talks about uh, the authority of the uh, defendant in the equation. Are they a fiduciary? Are they a family member? Um, you know, are they a legal professional? Uh, but let's talk uh, for a second about, I want to focus on C and D, uh, the other parts of uh, this definition. And let's take a look at C. The actions or tactics defendant use. Actions or tactics used may include, but not, are not limited to. Controlling plaintiff's necessaries of life, medication, interaction with others, access to information okay so when you have someone who cuts off the family uh, who hires caregivers who only report to that person uh, who checks phone calls who goes into meetings uh, with uh, lawyers doctors professional who has inserted themselves in every aspect of the senior's life uh, you have a great amount of proof uh, as to this one and i like two because it's unusual using affection intimidation or coercion okay now the coercion is the classic hey if you don't give me what i want i'm leaving and you're on your own there'll be no one here to help you but affection someone who cozies up to the senior citizen someone who hasn't been in their life for years and years except for the last 30 to 60 days of their life and they use affection uh, as a weapon uh, look at item three initiating changes in personal or property rights using hate or secrecy to make those changes. You make quick changes. You don't tell anybody about it. Again, all evidence of financial elder abuse, claiming expertise in making changes. You got to come with me because um, I know what you need. You need to be in this type of high risk investment at this point in your life. Uh, and then D is the, the classic. You must consider the unfairness of the result. So if you have a senior citizens, uh, whose entire life plan has been to leave everything to their kids and grandkids. And that changes at age 83 when they meet this person who inserts themselves into their life. That, again, is great evidence uh, of undue influence. We can take a look at the next slide. And here's just some examples. I know uh, most of the attorneys watching this have seen this, uh, but this is what we see uh, in everyday practice. Um, Financial planner cultivates trust, then initiates inappropriate transaction, producing large commissions with little or no benefit to the elderly. There's no reason for an 85-year-old to go into a high-risk uh, investment. Uh, there's no reason for a you know 65-year-old to flip investments that are going to have the same return, yet now they're going to pay a, a great number of uh, commissions and fees. So we see a lot of churning cases. Item two, uh, sweetheart romance or new friend begins. This is the classic uh, sweetheart swindle. I've actually tried a, a jury case on this, but this is the situation where certain groups monitor the obituaries to see when a spouse loses uh, their spouse or significant other. And then they move in once they're alone. And they go in and they say, hey, you know me, I met you at the grocery store. And within 30 days, they're in the house, the house is in 
the new sweetheart's name, the bank accounts are in the sweetheart name, and all the money is being transferred. Uh, that one we see uh, quite often, and, and those are much more straightforward. The ones that are more subtle uh, are the, uh, look at item three, erosion of an estate plan. These are the uh, elder abusers who are a little bit more cunning. Uh, they go to their uh, estate planning lawyer and they take off a little piece at a time. You know, if I just took the car, would anyone notice? Uh, then they take a bigger piece and a bigger piece uh, over time. And the last one, of course, uh, everyone sees is the caregiver. Uh, the caregiver who has to be at every meeting, the caregiver who wants control over finances, the caregiver who's whispering in the ear of the senior saying, you know, you can't live without me. Uh, and then lo and behold, the caregiver uh, has most of the assets at the end of the day. Uh, so what questions should you ask uh, on uh, a case like this? I mean, the first thing you got to ask, and I'm interested, Catherine, on your view on this is you got to look at with suspicion at the person coming in the door to you. So what is this person's relationship to the elder and what are their motivations? You know, just because a senior citizen changes their will later in life doesn't mean it's invalid. Um, you know, they're free. If they want to give all their money to the SBCA and not their children, they're free to do that. So who is the person coming into the door to see the plaintiff's lawyer? Because you have to do a very careful evaluation. And what are the motives of that person? Uh, why are they there? Uh, what is their history? Are they a person who's been caring for the senior citizen through their adult lives? Are they a person who's, you know, a Johnny come lately to the scene? Uh, if you turn, determine they're valid, they're, they're a person whose heart's in the right place, their mind's in the right place, they're looking to protect the senior citizen, do they have standing? Um, you know, were they getting something uh, that, that was taken away uh, in the trust? Are they, they have the power, um, you know, is there a power of attorney? Are they executor? Uh, so Catherine, let me ask you to chime in on that. Person comes in the door, they say, geez, my, my mother's been being abused. What, what do you look for? What's the first thing you do? Well, our focus is, I mean, we have not had a lot of people come in where I did not trust the person coming to us. We haven't had a lot of those cases. I mostly, my focus is on the elder. Um, and even though, and this is why I was saying a jury might feel differently, <laughs> um, even having, you know, looked at hundreds of these and taken a, a percentage of them, you know, sometimes the elder, for example, we have one right now where they say it's done, but they're continuing to talk to the scammer because she believes that he is still in love with her and, you know, not telling us. Uh, and, you know, we, I feel that I have to, you know, and now, especially in COVID, you know, mostly meeting people over Zoom, I really have to drill several times and I want several people in my firm to watch, you know, what is their what is their motive in wanting to do this? You know, and because most, you know, 99% of these is because the child caught it when it was too late for us. Um, and so a child comes in and the mom's like, I don't have any money or I don't whatever and didn't really know. So our focus is less on what your has been over the years, maybe just the type of cases coming to us, but I can totally, I totally agree with you. You need to see if it's a you know Johnny come lately or something like that. But, you know, what kind of witness is this person going to be, even though the law is certainly focused on the perpetrator or the assister and not the elder as a human being and as a trial lawyer, you've got to take into account that. I mean, it's just human nature, you know, and I find myself sometimes struggling with the saddest stories, which I'll tell later, the saddest stories that I'm like, how could someone do this when they which I'll talk about later is, you know, with mild cognitive dysfunction. So my, our investigation and intake is that, and then also the amount of money that's taken, we have to unfortunately look at those things. That's another thing we really look at. Um, and also um, I think sometimes we really look at how much it's affected their life. So unfortunately, like if someone's taken their life savings versus for example, and this is just, you know, trial lawyer speaking, Versus someone who has a lot of money, and but they had a lot of money taken or something. If someone's destitute on the street, it's something that we will consider more. Um, but it has to be have a certain threshold, um, especially against a bank. Because I will say um, that 
the banks are more scorched earth than most everyone except that I've sued except for pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> you know, I mean, they fight every single thing and they're, you know, they really, I mean, they make the elder abuse lawyers in the representing uh, long-term care look like, you know, kittens. So uh, those are those are the things we look at I, uh, other than what you have spoken about. All right, so why don't we, uh, Catherine, I'm gonna kick it back to you. We're not gonna talk about types of elder abuse uh, cases. Yep. And we'll try to move through that so we can get to the questions and what to look for. Yep. So why don't we go to slide 18, great. Yeah, so um, obviously thefts and scams. Um, we've talked about that. I'm gonna talk about, that's the scams are, Sweetheart scams are really bad right now, really bad. Uh, women who are older, who are lonely, seeing a lot of those. And uh, and it's not just people who are, uh, and they find them online. I think they're finding them on like LinkedIn, Facebook, places like that. Um, because these, the people we've been seeing, their husbands didn't just die, their partners didn't just die. So we're seeing a lot of sweetheart scams um, in our cases right now. Um, and also, you know, we're we've also been seeing some other ones. I think I'm gonna talk about what we've been seeing later. Um, unauthorized access to accounts. That's the caregiver. We've had those cases who gets into the account in the other room, gets, and you know, you get a text back on, on the person they're caring for and they can get into their accounts and do that. Forging people's signatures. I. When I was early, when I was young, early in my career, I had a blind person, a blind person signing annuity documents. I mean, if I can't win that one, I got a problem. Uh, mis stealing, uh, misusing or stealing other person's money or possessions, coercing or deceiving an older person into signing any document, wills. Um, we haven't done a lot of those cases. Um, I would think that would be maybe some more probate people where people are coming in and having someone come in and sign the will. We get a lot of those calls. We do not take these cases. I'd be happy to find someone to refer those to. We get a lot of those calls. Um, gaming, uh, getting trust through trust mills. Um, I would say, that, like I said, those are the first cases I ever did probably 20 years ago was doing these cases where people had trust mills. I called it the black box. Someone would come go to a trust mill. I think Shauna's on here. She knows about those. We worked on those together, Shauna Reeves. You know, so, someone goes, they're in the paper. There's some famous people in California um, who are doing that. And they're like, we have a place to help you do a living trust and blah, blah, blah. And it would be like at a Holiday Inn or something like that. It might be an assisted living facility. They come home and they, they go there and they say, hey, can I see your box? Your box is all of your assets. And so that's when you see, Neil, you talked about churning, you know, churning things, moving them into different things. And so these trust mills and the free lunch seminar, seminars are terrible and they're a terrible goldmine uh, for the scammers. I used to see a lot of those. Improper use of conservatorship, guardian, guardianship, or power of attorney, uh, inappropriate insurance and annuity policies. Those are the other cases that I did a lot of at the beginning. And again, um, cases where the annuities really suck for the person are the ones that they're going to get a lot of commission on. It makes sense um, that you're going to make more money on a product that's better for the, the annuity company um, and uh, and real estate scams. We just actually took our first one on that. Let's go to the next one. Um, why target elders? Yeah, would you? The only thing I'd add to that list. Um, yeah, I, I think we we left it off because I think I helped create this list. It's reverse mortgages. And the issue with reverse mortgages, there's a lot of good ones out there, but the problem with them is that yes. all the fees are front loaded. Uh, so if you're 65 and in great health and you're going to live many, many years, your, your cost will be amortized over time. If you're 90 years old and you're getting a reverse mortgage, you, you are in trouble because your cost of funds is going to be incredibly, incredibly high. So I just flagged that one too. Yeah, reverse mortgages. So why are target elders targets? I mean, this could be a two hour <laughs> session. So I'll try to make this really short. There was a, a long time ago, I was reading the New York Times. There was a little teeny article in it and I sent it and I, and I ordered the, this was 20 years ago and I ordered the article on it. And basically what it said was a study that was done and I sent it to Prescott and you know, then we now we use it all the time. But basically when you age, 
your prefrontal cortex, okay, which is your judgment. That's the part that goes first, your judgment, okay? And so that is, so they did these different tests and it's a really interesting test and I, uh, and we use it all the time and we send it. But anyway, they used cards and they did this whole, and it, you know, it was a, it's a peer reviewed test. And it's turned out to be true that you're just, your judgment is less. So a lot of people, you know, you're lonely, you're more trusting, you know, all the obvious things, but from an actual organic brain um, standpoint, your brain changes. And so that's number one. Number two, mild cognitive um, impairment, MCI, I mean, I just took a deposition on the other day. The doctors don't even know what it is, most doctors. So anyway, MCI is something that a lot of elders have and to turn into actual dementia, um, of which we all know there's different kinds of dementia, immune mediated, there's, you know, Alzheimer's, there's frontal lobe, you know, all different kinds. But to actually get to that, that means you're dependent on someone for all of your activities of daily living. And so most people, you know, a lot of people don't meet that yet if they're still living at home and doing this. So people have mild cognitive impairment. So they're still able to take care of themselves. They can talk to Neil and I on the phone and we might not, we might not even pick it up, right? And so these people are the perfect victim for these for fraud, the perfect victim because people can't tell and the families can't tell what, what's going on. Okay, I think I have one more slide here on fiduciaries. I'm hoping that there are some fiduciaries on here because you guys are, other than banks, okay, are the front line. You are the front line to see these things. You've got the clients, you know, you're, you're, you're the conservatorship for someone or you're the trustee and you have a unique responsibility also, in my opinion, um, to respond and talk to someone about what's going on. And I'm not just talking about calling APS. I mean, you, you need to do that as well, but I'm thinking about, you know, calling Canner or if you're in a different state, any other who can like have you speak to a lawyer, but you guys are the ones that are gonna see this stuff first. So I really wanna give a shout out to anyone who is any fiduciary on this uh, webinar, or anyone in that kind of situation, you know, we really need you guys to come forward and, and help us out. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah. Okay, uh, so what's, why don't you go to our next slide, uh, which is what to look for. And I think this page we basically covered. So let's go to the next page, which is more focused on uh, financial institutions. Uh, nice graphic though, Neil, nice graphic. Yeah, like that? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of these uh, may be obvious. I do want to uh, touch upon some of the things. If you are concerned about a financial elder abuse situation, what you should be looking for. Uh, all right, so number one, obviously, increases in account activities, all right? That's kind of the one that everyone should be aware of. If that's happening, it's generally not happening for a good reason. It is incredibly rare for a senior citizen late in life to change their banking habits. So that's, that's number one. That's huge. That's yeah. the biggest one, that red flag by far. Number two, lar uh, gaps in checks. Um, this is the situation where someone has access to the senior's checks. They're taking the checks out. And the senior doesn't know what's happening. Uh, number three, and you'll see a theme here. And the, these all start with the word uncharacteristic. So new behaviors, uncharacteristic uh, NSF funds or overdrafts, uncharacteristic debit transaction, lapses in payments. Why is there lapse in payments? Because they're insufficient funds and didn't, lack of concern for penalties, et cetera. Uh, things of that nature. So what are the two takeaways? Large changes in activities and uncharacteristic activities. Now, when you have a case, I'm going to just give an example of a bank um, and how you prove something like this. Normally, when you sue in a bank, you'd say, okay, we want all your you know, policies and procedures uh, with respect to suspicious activities. When you uh, report suspicious activities, uh, what you do, how you train your employees, and they'll come back. The bank will say, well, we have the the best policies and procedures of the United States. We train everyone. Um, they've got to follow these procedures, blah, blah, blah. So th there's a couple of things that are very important there. Number one, don't just settle for the training uh, policies and procedures. Most of these banks are incredibly sophisticated. So they have algorithms that they run that can detect when there is unusual activity in an account. 
So you have to make sure you ask for any algorithms, scientific or computer modeling that the bank implements to see if there is any type of suspicious activity. Number two, the best way to prove liability of a financial institution is to show they didn't follow their own procedures. So when you're taking the testimony of the bank employee who tells you they have the gold standard in policies and procedures uh, for detecting and preventing fraud, you, you get them to lock in to all those questions. And when she tells you that this is the best policy going, let her talk. And then you want to establish all the ways the banks did not follow their own procedures. Best way to establish liability of a bank is to establish they did not follow their own fraud procedures. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is still on account activity. Um, and same general theme, you know, abrupt changes to financial documents, new powers of attorneys, changes to joint accounts. And this is not so much the, the bank account itself having a lot of activity. These are the surrounding documents having activity. Again, incredibly unusual, uh, you know, not totally unheard of, but very unusual for late in life for a senior citizen to be making wholesale changes to powers of attorney, beneficiaries, you know, things of that nature. What is the reason for that? Um, and then uh, item nine here is something that you will see all the time. This is the, you know, the new person, new person, new account. Um, you know, what, again, generally speaking, when a new friend pops up, you got to look at that very closely. You know, new friend, and particularly when there's an age difference between your 82-year-old client and the new friend who's 35, something you want to look at. And often when you have a new friend, the new friend becomes a new user uh, on the bank accounts. And number 13, and Catherine and I talk about this all the time, uh, this is the one, uh, we must get three calls a week on this. Senior citizen is duped into wiring their life savings to a foreign country. Um, the person uh, tells them that's for the, you know a member of the military or a sick family member. That person's gone to the wind, and the only one left standing there is the bank. Uh, so uh, that's what we we're talking about before that whole DOS issue. You want to be in state court, but nail down the bank policies, not just the policies on training employees, but their policies on algorithms and how they detect uh, suspicious activity. So, Catherine, let me kick it over back to you for the next uh, slides. Okay, I got a rip. I got two minutes. Let's go. Yep. <laughs> All right, next slide. Uh, we have a publisher's clearinghouse case right now. Can't believe it. That's happening. Uh, we're talking about, we've got a case where someone was asked to uh, support underprivileged children in Central America, elders wiring from abroad. We just talked about that. Uh, the ones about the sweetheart scams, which I personally, those are the most heartbreaking to me. Next. Um, Next slide, please. Okay, again, we've got people transferring, uh, the caregiver might be transferring, uh, multiple wire transfers. I agree with Neil. We, I wonder if we're getting the same people bouncing back between us because we get about as many as well in those exact cases. Um, this is a sad one. Elders uh, told that social security number was hacked and then they have to withdraw all the cash uh, from their bank. We have another one where someone said, oh, you know, your your Bank of America has been hacked. So you got to move it to another, into a dummy account. And this very sub seemingly sophisticated person does that. Okay, banks are on notice. Let's do the next one. Uh, so banks, like he said, the algorithms, I've actually never got the algorithm. What I have found out is that age is not in the algorithm. It is not in the algorithm. They, they do not put it in there. I have found that out. Um, but the main thing I want to talk to you about is they don't talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. They've got the essay, the suspicious activity report. They've got the elder abuse. They've got the uh, fraud unit. They've got the tellers, they've got the managers, they've got the, uh, you know, the people working for the advisors. We, we haven't talked about that yet. The advisors are a separate company. Uh, we, we, there's other people that we sue. All these people are all in this person's account and they don't talk to each other. There could be, there could be one, the fraud people could be looking at it and the person at the at, on the front line meeting this elder saying these things has no clue and to me 
that is the biggest problem that they aren't talking to each other. I mean, the algorithms we all know, like, oh, I just spent $26 in an Adidas store and they're calling me and saying it's suspicious activity. So people are wondering, well, why is it that, you know, a hundred, that, you know, a million dollars goes by and nobody calls me. It's Neil's, what he's calling the algorithms and stuff, but their algorithms suck, <laughs> basically. And he's absolutely right. Um, and I think Neil, uh, oh, I'm going to talk, oh, Neil, you have a couple more, but let me just talk about the last slide. And I won't even show it. You got to take the tellers. You got to take the managers. You got to take, Neil's exactly right. You got to do the PMQs on policies, trainings, detections, red flags, events, know your customer reporting. You take the PMQ on that. And I will promise you, even at a big, big bank, they will not know it. And unfortunately, even you talk to them about the, you know, they used to get a thousand calls a month. Now they get 10,000. Guess what? You still got the same two people in that department going through all those calls, even though they have 10 times the amount of calls, they still have the same amount of staff. So it's just like the nursing home cases. They don't have enough staff. It's the same thing. So get them, get their policies, get the PMQs, get to show, show what they are, ask them, take them way out on the limb and just say like, even if you had 20 of these red flags, do you still have to report it? They will say no. Okay, because it's just a policy. So that I agree with Neil a thousand percent. That's what you need to do. Um, take them out on a limb, show that they're not doing it. And, you know, and you're done. Neil. Uh, so let me just make one other comment uh, on, and we can skip the slides, then we'll go to questions. But on, on the teller, the teller depositions that Catherine's talking about. Nobody knows more about a problem than the person at the bottom who's getting blamed for it. Right. So when you take the teller deposition, they're not going to want to wear it. Okay. So when you go through all the gold standard uh, training that this teller is supposed to have received, you'd be shocked how many tellers will tell you, no, I don't know about that. We have an elder abuse policy, never heard of it, because they're not going to take the fall. So when all the managers say, you know, here's our standards. Everyone sign off on our standards. This teller didn't follow them. The teller is going to have a different story. So understand that there is not a unity of interest always between tellers and their managers and exploit that uh, to your benefit when handling these cases. So I see that we've got about I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes left. And I know we were supposed to leave some time for questions. So Jennifer, let me kick it back to you and uh, let you uh, decipher what, what questions you'll be giving us. So thank you very much for your, uh, we're all at LAS calling it your masterclass on how to pursue these cases. Um, it's an amazing presentation. And for people interested in those final slides, they'll be made available on our website after the recording is available. Um, our audience has many questions, all of which we hope to get answered in our Q&A. We have a few minutes set aside. So if we don't get anything answered today, we will try to follow up after the presentation. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please submit them into the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. In order to see us all on screen, click on speaker view in the top right corner. So let's get started with our first question. Oh, okay, there they are. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to this one. Is there a way to get a list of attorneys that want these bank cases, especially for other parts of California, like Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo and LA? It would be so helpful. And also thank you for being willing to share pleadings. Yes, um, I can answer that. Um, so California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, we have uh, two panels. One is, our, is a panel for um, physical neglect cases. And then we also have a panel for financial abuse cases, which we are trying. Um, I'm involved with them very much since I was, you know, 11. And so, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to get people a on the panel and we do have a panel of people, um, throughout, um, California. Uh, there's not a lot of us who sue banks, uh, because I think that they're pretty tough cases. I mean, I think there's maybe, I want to say five firms or so Neil and my firm being to our firm being two of them, but just regular, please contact Canner and they do have a list of people. Um, and if not, they'll be able to, um, show you the right way. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with Catherine. Um, and for the lawyers out there who are thinking about doing these cases, I would tell you they're they're very re rewarding and they're a lot of fun. Uh, so if you there's a pretty good feeling at night when you go after a bank or a financial institution and you return to a senior citizen, uh, their life savings 
who thought it, they'd never see it again. Uh, there are great cases to do. So if there's lawyers out there who want to do them, uh, contact Catherine and I. We're happy to give you pleadings, motions, everything we've got. Uh, but, you know, join the party. Yeah. And also, I will say to contact Canner because we are looking at having people who are less, who want to do it, who are, have not done them yet to maybe start sort of like, I'm going to call it a baby bar almost, but we are looking for people who are interested in doing them because we want to train those people because we do have a little bit of a dearth in California to do them. So even if you're interested, please contact the um, canner on that. Thank you. So I'm going to go to, it seems like a lot of this could probably, it could be stopped by the banks before you need to step in and sue them. As you said, suspicious activity algorithms exist and are in place. Do you have any theories about why banks fail and fail again to protect elders' accounts from being drained by scammers? Catherine, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, I think that what needs to happen is there's these, you know, we can't tell anyone it's their private money. I think that people over a certain age, even though I know it sounds protectionist, or um, should have a trusted family member on the account. And they should give, and you know, it's always hard to have that conversation with your mom or your dad or something. But I think that if you had a trusted advisor, um, I think that would really help a lot. And that is actually a stymie in a lot of our cases. Um, and so, and I'm afraid, and I know that they're afraid, just like in uh, long-term care, they're afraid to have a really strong, robust policy because they're afraid when they um, violate that policy, they're going to be held, um, you know, negligent or reckless on their on their case. So. You know, legislation obviously is an obvious um, area. Um, we are trying to work on more legislation and make this more robust. Um, and, uh, you know, the banking industry will uh, always be against anything that we try to do. But I do think just that one step of having a family member on there so they can call and say, hey, you know, your dad was doing $10 checks to the church, like we had that, or your nephew or your uncle. $10 checks to the church and now he's doing like 30,000 ones and saying he's going to send money to his nephew or something like that. Just someone to call and that they should have to call that person. I think that would really help a lot. Yeah, I agree with Catherine. I would also say that there has been some progress with banks. Um, you know, well, I've been a lawyer about 30 years and I remember when I started doing cases, it was, well, it's their money. They do what they want. That was it. Senior citizen, their money can't touch them. Now we're seeing you know, uh, a lot more uh, these uh, red flag policies, suspicious activity policies. So they're moving in the right direction. But I just think banks as a whole institutionally, um, you know, kind of avoid topics like this. Oh, God, if we go into that elder abuse area, that's going to create exposure for us because we'll have some tellers that won't follow our policies and they'll do what Stebner and McCarthy are saying. We'll get sued for not following our policies. So it's they're very protectionist uh, as an institution. But I do think some progress has been made. Thank you. So I'm going to go to a complicated one. We see some financial institutions so paranoid about being sued that they freeze the elder's account after hearing that abuse may have happened or they know it happened. They refuse to unfreeze the elder's account after receiving a duty, a duly authorized DPOA from a person, usually family, trying to stop the abuse and pay for elder care. Months can go by while the bank sends the matter to legal. What can be done about this? The bank is aiding abuse by depriving the elder of his or her own money. Well, I, yeah, I've never heard of that nor seen it. When I used to do uh, the analogy that comes to my mind, when I used to do med mal with uh, breast cancer failure diagnosed, I remember I had an expert say, I'd rather do a lot of biopsies than none, I guess. So it kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Like, you know, I mean, I feel badly for that person, but you know, I have not seen that before. I don't know if Neil has or not, but I feel like they should, I mean, for the vast majority of people, there should be some able to, to freeze. And if they do that, yeah, obviously need, something needs to be done to be able to get out of it in a more expedited or ex-party manner. So I don't know the circumstances around that, but I've not seen that. Yeah, so I don't know what case you're talking about. It's, you know, it sounds like a family member situation where one member of the family is trying to use funds, the other one uh, freezes it. I would say that's more the exception rather than the rule. I agree with uh, Catherine. You know, I wish the banks would freeze uh, assets more, but the the problem when it's unjustifiable is what you mentioned. They need a better back end. They need a better way to get out of um, the unfree. Right. That's not something that we see too often. You know, the uh, bank coming to the rescue by freezing assets. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try and squeeze in a few more. 
Uh, is it still legal for the Alameda County Recorder's Office to convert title on my property to someone else without notifying me of the same? That sounds like a Stebner question. <laughs> my gut's going to say, uh, no, I mean, I, actually, I didn't know that that was even a potentiality that you could do that. I mean, I guess, well, um, over vague and broad, <laughs> I don't know the situation if they're a conservatorship. I don't know what, you know, I don't know that person's situation enough actually to answer that. So I'm not really punting, but I think I would need to know more about what that person's um, actual situation is in order to do that. And that's the kind of question really that should go to more of an estate planning person um, because I'm assuming that that person's in some sort of potentially uh, protected situation, but I don't know. Is there a reason dependent children are covered by other laws? Is it to protect the children? I have no, I have no idea why they cut that off. Um, I don't know if Neil knows, but it's, um, I think it's something we've actually been talking about in Sacramento to actually change that. Um, and I've not seen it in the legislative history. I don't know. I don't know the reason why. I mean, having been involved in laws, I'm sure somebody must have, that must have been something that someone gave up somewhere, I'm assuming. But uh, I don't know why that's done. Well, I was told, was done. I'll give you what I have. I know about this, yeah. which is yeah. there's which is at the time the elder abuse law was enacted, there was a gap because there was already child protection laws. There was a gap for people with disabilities and otherwise dependent between 18 and 64. So that's the gap they covered. And the assumption, whether it's right or wrong, was that other laws protect um, children. Uh, so this area was filled in. Thank you. Okay, and this will be the last one. If an elder is scammed but doesn't have any names or identifying information of the perpetrator, what information can the elder show as proof? Well, that's um, most of our cases, frankly. I mean, we don't know, you know, we they're fake, and if they're fake names and they're wires, and actually we don't know who they are through the entire uh, pendency of the action. So that is usually our case. I don't know, Neil, about you, but we, I mean, I had a case once where I knew because she was in jail you know, I was a caregiver, but, uh, you know, I've had cases where I knew the care, I mean, caregiver cases, I know, and we didn't even talk about caregiver, just super quickly. Another institution that um, you can bring cases against are these in-home care places um, who are sending people to people's houses. I mean, I had a case where they had a mugshot in the file and they sent that person to someone's house and then they ripped off the person. And that's kind of a large institution actually uh, that, uh, that did that. And so those caregivers, uh, are usually good. The problem with those, I'll just say quickly, is that what happens with the caregiver, because they're being charged, you know, it's $35 to go through an agency. They stay someone there. So, Hey, it'll be cheaper. If I, if you just go through me, I'll quit the caregiving thing and you pay me 25 bucks an hour. So then that person who's the scammer, then the people who brought them into the home or say, Hey, they're not an agent of ours anymore. We've always gotten around that. Um, but I've done several caregiver cases. Um, I find those to be much easier cases than these other ones, but um, that's the only time that I ever know the identity of the scammer. I agree with Catherine. Typically, the scammer is in the wind. You never see the scammer. You don't have any information on who they are, where they came from, what the real names are, which is why you go back to where the money come from, uh, and it, generally, it comes out of a bank. Uh, and that's why we look at that substantial factor standard where you you were not the only cause, but you were a very you were a cause, a substantial uh, cause of the senior losing the money. Because if you had followed your own procedures, uh, if you had um, you know, taken appropriate action, the money never would have been transferred. The last thing I want to mention uh, is that a lot of times when you resolve cases, um, there's factors outside the law and the facts. And here, one of the main factors is reputational risk to these banks. So these banks do not want to be hammered in the press trying to explain that they allowed $500,000 to be transferred to a foreign country and they emptied a senior citizen's bank account because they had an obligation, because a senior citizen wanted to do it, there were no red flags. You know, when they start explaining these cases, they're losing. So because they have a significant reputational risk, a lot of these banks are inclined to pay early. Uh, you may not get all the money back, but you're certainly going to get almost all of it back. And then, um, you know, they want to close the book and move on. So 
understand the entire arsenal available to you. Yeah, and I actually, I'd like to close two things. Um, I like to say, first of all, I think that Neil's point on um, substantial factor is probably the most important point that was made in this entire uh, program. Uh, number two, the thing that really irks me the most about these cases, and it wasn't anywhere on here, is that the banks are actively marketing elders and telling elders, and we have all of, I mean, against pretty much every bank, all of their ads, your money is safe. We have we have these red flag things. We have people watching. We, you know, we've got the, the elder abuse unit. We've got all these different things. And the fact that they're actively bringing in people who hold 80% of the wealth in the United States of America, and then bringing them in are the false pretense that you know their money is safe when it is an absolute lie because they have these policies and procedures. If followed, would catch it, but they don't follow their own policies and procedures. So that that that, that bait and switch to me is to the most morally egregious part of these cases. I mean, if they're if you're going to do that and get someone in there thinking their money is safe like actually having like Wells Fargo has a bus that a guy named Ron Long, whose deposition I've taken goes out. He goes around the bus saying, talking anti-elder abuse, anti-elder abuse at Wells Fargo, who is, you know, is one of our main targets. When you go out and you say that it, you know, it's, it's not moral to me to be able to do that. And that's, that's my, that's my irk. <laughs> well, you have uh, quite a fan club at LAS, I'll tell you that. We agree. Um, and so with that, um, I we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's program, and I'll share a few reminders for everyone. Um, first off, thank you, Catherine and Neil, for your insightful presentation. You can go ahead and turn off your screens at this point. We really appreciate all of the information you brought us today and all of your um, answers to the many questions we had. Uh, thank you again to the sponsors of our webinar series. Today's presentation and recording will be available on the LAS website following the conclusion of this series. If you need CEU credits, please look out for the post-event email in your inbox in the next few days with further instructions. We welcome your feedback about this webinar so that we can continue improving the content we provide and on your experience. A link will be included in the post-event email. For any questions or comments about today's webinar or the program as a whole, you can email us at conference at lashicap.org. Thank you again for joining us today, and we wish you a great rest of your week. Thank you.